All right, welcome back. CS 125, end of our second week. It's cold outside. Wow. You guys are the brave ones that battled the temperatures today. It's one of those days where, like, you know if you just stay outside, you're going to die. Um, gives you some appreciation for civilization. Okay, so today, what we're going to do is we're going to keep talking about arrays. We're going to do some review to start. And then we're going to bring together two of the things we talked about this week, and we're going to start actually solving some problems. So you know, computer science is this, in programming in particular, which is what we're learning right now, is this incredibly powerful tool for solving problems. So far, what we've been looking at are these building blocks, but what we're going to start doing over the next few weeks is actually making this more concrete, solving problems together using these basic capabilities that you now have, because you've learned pretty much everything there is to know about how to write simple imperative computer programs. So we're going to start doing that together. Well, let's start off by uh, a little bit of review from last time. So remember, we talked a little bit last time about loops, which is a way of having the computer repeat a set of actions over and over again. One of the reasons why this is interesting is because once we start talking about representing multiple values um, in a data structure called an array, we can actually start to work with lots of interesting types of data. Like, for example, the you know, array of values that we could use to store the temperature on every day in, you know, somewhere in Champaign, or every hour, for example. So a Java array stores a series of values of the same type. So again, everything that I put into an array, when I declare an array, I have to tell Java what type of values I'm going to put in it. And I can only put those kind of values in the array. So if I declare an array of ints, I can't put a character in there, et cetera. The arrays are our first example of a data structure. So like the name implies, a data structure brings structure to data. It adds something to the data that it contains. In the case of an array, we're putting values in order, one after another. That's what this data structure is doing. It's taking a bunch of values that could be put in a bunch of different orders, and it's establishing an order for those values. And the order matters. So again, if I look at a, you know, the human genome, the order of those base pairs is critical. There's only four base pairs in the human genome. But the order in which they appear is what you know, gives rise to different types of life, creates different types of proteins, etc. So in music, the order in which those measurements of sound pressure occur is what creates the waves that we interpret as various tones and things like this. Right? So the order is inc incredibly important. Data structures add order to those values. Because they do that, now every value that I put in array also has this other piece of data. Sometimes we refer to this as metadata, data about data. The metadata is an index. It's position in the array. So once I put values into an array, I know something else about those values. I've structured them in a particular order. And to do that, I had to decide where they go. And so after I'm done, I have an index for each value. So as a reminder, here's how we declare arrays in Java. On line two, I'm declaring a value, a single value of type int, integer. On line three, once I put those two brackets, behind an int, what I'm declaring is an array. So this is now a variable that can store multiple values. At the bottom, it shows you examples for characters. So this is review. The size of an array cannot be changed in Java once it's initialized. So here's how we actually create an array and initialize it once we're ready to have it actually store some values. So on line two, I see on the left side, I'm saying to Java, I want to declare an array of integers. I'm going to call it multiple. Now, on the right side, I have a little bit of new syntax, which is this new keyword. It's going to make more sense to us in a couple weeks. Int, which is the type, and then inside those brackets, that's the number of values that this array is going to store. So I'm declaring and initializing an array that can store eight integer values. Arrays also have this nice property, which is this is new. So this is also new syntax. Every array variable that I create in Java knows how many values it contains. And that is important. It's actually really useful for writing loops, for example, that look at every element in the array. So again, I have a little bit of new syntax on line three. I have the name of the variable, multiple, and then a dot, length. So given a variable that's an array 
that stores an array of values, I can ask it how many values it contains. That is always an int in Java. It's always an integer. I can't have an array. It doesn't make sense to have an array that stores a, a floating point number of values. Right? This is an integer. It's a count. All right, in the bottom, you see that I can split those two things in half. So on line six, I have the initialization, or the declaration. I'm telling Java I'm going to uh, use a variable called all, and I'm going to use it to store an array of characters. And then on line eight, I actually initialize it to store four characters. All right. We also looked at ways to initialize arrays and actually set the values right when they're declared, similar to what I did for a single value. To do this, I use this bracket syntax, curly brace, I guess it's a curly brace, sorry. And I can do this with integers and with characters. When I do this, I don't have to tell Java how many values the array stores, because it knows that. It's just going to count however many values are inside that initializer. OK. One thing that trips people up when they get started with this is that whenever we talk about the index of values inside of an array, we start counting at 0. And this is just something that you're going to have to get used to, because this is endemic throughout computer science. So the first value in array, I access through this uh, array you know, um, index notation. So I take an array named A. If I want to either change or retrieve its first value, that's the value at index 0, not the value at index 1. What that means is that if I have an array of a certain length, its last value is not at index array.length. It's at index array.length minus 1. So for example, if I have an array that stores seven values, its first value is at array index 0. Its last value is at array index 6, not 7. Again, this is going to confuse you a little bit. But if you think about it, if I had a valid value at index 7, I would have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 values in the array, not 7. OK, you guys will get used to this. So let's do a little bit of practice with this. Um, the other thing we looked at last time was using this bracket syntax to get or set the values inside the array. So on the first line of this little snippet, I'm declaring an array of integers called 2s, and I'm initializing it to store three values. The first value is 1, the second value is 2, the third value is Four. So the metadata that I'm associating with these three values is that I'm assigning an index of 0 to value 1, I'm assigning an index of 1 to, to the value 2, and I'm assigning an index of 2 to the value 4. So I'm putting these values in order. So what's going to be printed on line 2? So over on the right side, I have 2s. That's my array variable. I'm using this bracket notation to retrieve the first value, the value at index 0 from 2s. So I just set that up. That's going to be 1. I can also change the values inside the array using this array, uh, using this bracket syntax. So on line 3, I'm changing the value of 2s to be 2. So on line 4, the new, sorry, I'm changing the value at index 0 to be 2. So on line 4, I'm going to print off that. That's now 2. On line 5, I'm printing off the value at index 2 which is the third value in the array. What is that? 4, OK? And then what am I doing at the bottom? So here, I'm printing off the last value, 2's dot length minus 1. So 2's dot length is going to be 3. 2's dot length minus 1 is going to be 2. It's the last value in the array, also 4. All right, so let's run this and make sure that it does what we think it's going to do. That's nice. Let's make this a little bit longer and see what happens. OK, so now on line 5, I'm still printing the third value in the array, which is still 4. But line 6 is now printing the fourth value in the array, which is at index 3. 2's dot length is 4. 2's dot length minus 1 is 3. So I'm still printing the last value in the array. No matter how many values I put into this array, that print statement on line 6 will always print whatever the last one. All right, so what's going to happen here? Yeah, sorry, question. Ah, OK. So there's something wrong with this piece of code. Let's look at it together. I declared an array called values of type int, line 1. I set it up to hold four values, 1, 2, 4, and 8, in that order. So the index of 
1 is 0, the index of 2 is 1, the index of 4 is 2, the index of 8 is 3, and then I'm printing off its last value, right? It's got four values in it. So I'm printing off the value to index 4. What's, going, what's wrong with this? What's going to happen? Yeah. Right. There is no fourth index because the fourth index would be the fifth value, and this array only has four values in it. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to get an error when I try to execute this code. And this is something that you guys will get quite familiar with, particularly on our second MP, MP1. We also number from zero in this class. So our first MP that comes out next Monday will be MP0. The next one that comes out a week later will be MP1. MP1 will give you a lot of practice with working with multidimensional arrays. And I'm sure that many of you will see this error when you start working on that array index out of bounds exception. This will make more sense to us quite a bit later in the class. But for now, what Java is telling you is, hey, you tried to use a bad index for your array. That bad index in this case is four. And when you encounter this error when you're using Android Studio, it's also going to tell you the exact line number on which it happened, which is useful information. So I'll get that same error if I use 10. Um, if you are coming, again, from a language like Python. Does anyone who knows a little bit of Python know what this does? Yeah, way in the back. OK. Does anyone know what this does in Python? Yeah. Yeah, so in Python, it, Python uh, lists are kind of nice, and this, this will give me the last value. What does this do in Java? Bad. It does bad in Java. Yeah, Java does not do this. Right? So Java arrays. If you want the last value, you have to use that syntax I showed you before. They're not that clever. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so the question is, again, if you're, if, if you're familiar with Python or the programming, can you do slices on arrays? No. Yeah. Good question. All right, so let's talk about probably one of the most annoying limitations about arrays in Java. And this is also true in several other programming languages from around that time. This is also true in C++ and in C. I have to know how large they are when I create them. And if I want to change their size later, it's not straightforward to do. So I can't take an existing Java array and just easily add a value to it. If I want to change its size later, I have to create a new array and copy all of the old data from the old array to the new array. So this is not particularly uh, straightforward to do. In some places, this can complicate our computer programs because we may not know exactly how large an array is supposed to be before we start. And so sometimes we have to make the array larger than we want. Sometimes there's other limitations that, um, that this produces. So interesting fun fact. How many people here have a net ID that ends with two? How many people here have a net ID that ends with three? Any fours? Anyone with double digits? What do you got? 15? It's pretty good. Anyone higher than that? 40? OK. Higher than that? 69. That's good. It's an interesting one, too. Um, you might have thought they would have skipped that one. Um, anyway, yeah, so why? Does anyone know why this is? Has anyone noticed anything about your net IDs? Your, your email addresses? You've been emailing each other. Do you guys still do that? Is that a thing? Is the email still a thing? Yeah. Well, but so what? Like, I, we could just do first name dot last name. That would at least help. Or first name dot middle initial dot last name. I know you know the answer, so I'm not going to call. Anybody? Yeah. All the same length. Yeah, anyone notice that? Actually, they're not all the same length. That's almost, almost correct. But there's something, you're really close. They're not all the same length, but they are all, they're all short, yes. Eight characters. Jane Doe 2. J-A-N-E, D-O-E 2, eight. It's the maximum length of a net ID or the first part of an email address here at the University of Illinois. And unfortunately, sadly, at many other places. 
some places have fixed this. My brother uh, went to a forward-thinking university that even back when he was in college had much longer email addresses that it provided to students. But why? Why is this the case? The longest length of any NetID is eight. And so what that means is that we're going through all these contortions, right? So unfortunately, if Jane Doe had enrolled here 10 years ago, she would have been Jane Doe. But now, there is a Jane Doe already. So we have to refer to her to as Jane Doe 2, or 3, or 4, or 69, apparently. Um, why is this? It's connected to something that we just talked about. Your NAN ID is stored in some array in some ancient computer program. And whoever, I would like to know who this person is, uh, because they've caused a lot of pain and suffering uh, for people. Uh, but somebody, as once upon a time, when they were programming a very early computer system, decided that the part of the program that would store your username would only store usernames of up to eight characters. And we're still living with this. 40 years later, right? So, so this is why this is the case. There is some part of the program, and this is like, again, an ancient part of the, probably the operating systems that run some of our, you know, the machines that you guys probably may never actually physically use or even realize exist, right? But these ancient pieces of computer software um, had this limitation. Because at the time, we'll talk a little bit about uh, a similar limitation that um, is affecting the internet. But it, at the time, you know, the person who was writing this code was like, yeah, this is not a problem, right? I mean, you know, who would imagine that a machine would have more than like 10 or 15 users, right? And now these machines essentially have to maintain accounts for tens of thousands of students, maybe even more. Right? So this is where this comes from. Now you know. Okay. So Java has other array-like data structures that are more flexible than this. So you may be thinking, man, this is a, why did I take this class? You know, I, this, this is like a crappy language, you know? I, I can't even resize an array. But we will talk, Java has, uh, you know, uh, ways to change the value of, change the number of items in a series over time, right, as the program is running. Um, we'll discuss them later in the class. But for the next few weeks, we're going to work with these very simple Java array data structures that do have this limitation. So one of the reasons why we're talking about arrays now is that loops and arrays really are sort of made for each other. They belong together. Probably, you know, we talked about common, loop, common loops last time. And I will tell you that this is probably the most common loop you will ever write. This is a loop that goes through all the values in an array. So arrays are tremendously useful for storing data of lots of different types that are interesting for computers to process. And a very, very common thing to do in a computer program is to write a loop that goes through an array one value at a time and does something. We'll do a couple examples of this in a few minutes. In this case, I'm just printing off every element of the array. But let's look at this. So again, this is, this is one of those loops that you just, you know, you could probably write blindfolded by the time you've done this for a little while. So I have an array called primes that I've initialized. It has, looks like, six values in it. These are integer values. And then I have a for loop on line three. So for loop syntax, I have a loop variable called i that I initialize in my for loop statement. I start it at zero. I run it up until it's less, as long as it's less than primes.length, not less than or equal to. Again, you. At some point, you won't even wonder why this is the case anymore, but we'll talk about it right now. And then I increment it every time. So it starts at zero, and I continue the loop until it reaches primes.length. So the length of the array that I'm going through. And then inside that loop, I do something with every element of the array. And I use my loop variable here to access each element of the array one at a time. So what's going to happen the first time this loop runs? i is going to be 0, and I'm going to print off the first element of the array, which is 2. Then I go back to the top of the loop. I increment i. Now i is 1. Next time through the loop, I'm going to print the second value of the array, which is 3. I'm going to keep doing this until the last time I go through the loop, 
i is going to be 5. We're going to print off the sixth value of the array, which is again at index 5. That's 13. Then I'm going to go back to the top of the loop. I'm going to increment i. i is going to be 6. I'm going to say, is i still less than primes.length? Remember that arrays in Java have this nice property, which is that they know how long they are. Primes knows that it has six values, so primes.length is six. Is six less than six? No. I'm going to break out of the array, and I'm done. So again, this is by far the most common, the most useful loop uh, that you will use. Given an array, go through all of its contents. When we get to multidimensional arrays that allow us to store even more interesting kinds of data, you'll see the analog of this for multidimensional arrays, which is to go through all the elements in a multidimensional array. But this is the way to do it for a single dimensional array. Okay. So this, I just want to point this out because this is another, you know, uh, type of loop. It's a new, kind of a new type of loop, but it's very, very useful. So this is so common where I'm essentially going through an array and I'm examining every value. Then in Java, there's a shortcut for this that I want you to have seen. So at the bottom, I see a loop that looks a little different than I'm used to. I have a variable declaration inside the loop declaration, like I did with the uh, for loop that I was looking at before. But I have this colon, and then on the right side, I have the name of the array. So this is something in Java that's called the enhanced for loop. And what it does is it gives me every value in the loop starting at the first and ending at the last. I don't have to worry about the index. So these two pieces of code on the top and on the bottom do exactly the same thing. So on the top, I have to use the index that I'm maintaining in the loop, my loop variable i, to pull items out of the array one at a time. On the bottom, this enhanced for loop does this form. Okay, we'll look at examples of both of these. Questions about this before we go on? So we're going to do, we're going to spend some time today now practicing with loops and arrays and doing some fun things together. Yeah? Nope. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, with this enhanced for loop, let's say I want to go through every other element of the array, or let's say that I want to go through backwards. No. Yeah. Um, I'm, for, with this syntax, I'm going to go start at the beginning and go one by one. The other thing to note about this at the bottom is that inside the loop, you don't know what index you're using. So you know the values one at a time. And again, there's times where you don't care about the index. But if you need to know the index, if you care about the position of the value in the array, which you do sometimes, then you can't use this syntax either. Yeah, good question. Any other questions about arrays? Yeah. So, okay, good question. So the question is, if I change the value that I'm accessing inside here, will it be saved in the array? The answer is no. Yeah, so I'm getting copies of the values inside the array. Uh, remind me in a minute, and we'll do an example like this. Today. Yes, you can see it. It's a good question. Yeah. No. No. You can call that whatever you want. Yeah, sorry. This is confusing. I could call this i or foo or whatever. Yeah, so the variable name here is not important. Right? So the question was, do I have to name my array with an s because the for loop here does that? Um, I would suggest one you know, principle for good variable names that I would claim is that frequently when you have an array, you're storing multiple values. So it's frequently appropriate to use a variable name that does have a plural form. Right? But it's not required here. Yeah, great question. Yeah, we'll go through some of these in a minute, and we'll talk about it. Okay. So, I want to stop and point something out. So you guys did your first quiz in the CBTF this week. So this is the spring semester. So I mentioned this before. In the fall semester, the class is full of all these hotshot computer scientists. You know, there's, some, there's a couple of them here. They, they know. They're, they're going to know who they are. Right? The rest of you 
are the people from outside computer science. And maybe you feel like, I don't know, is this for me? Is this too hard? Am I going to cut it or whatever? And I want to tell you something. I am rooting for all of you. I am super, super excited about this class because I want you guys to do as well as the class did last fall. In fact, I think it would be fantastic if you outperformed the fall class. CS majors here, I mean, don't you feel like maybe it's time to get them off their high horse a little bit? You know, like the taste of reality here. This is stuff that anyone can learn. And if you are here and you're determined to learn it, you can. And we're here to help you. So here are the numbers so far. Quiz one from fall 2018, median score was a 94%. Pretty good. How did you guys do? 92. Also pretty good. So keep it up. You can learn this. This is no, there's no magical trick to doing this. It's just daily practice, putting in the effort. And I hope you guys continue to succeed at this level throughout the rest of the semester. This is statistically insignificant. Okay, this is fine. This is good. Keep up the good work. All right, so let's do some examples together with arrays. So I've got an array here of characters, and I want to print off every value. So this is one of these cases where if I want to, I can use my enhanced for loop syntax. So here's one way to do it. I'm using my enhanced for loop. On the left side of my enhanced for loop statement, I need to declare a single variable of the same type as the array. So that's going to be the value the way I have access to each value inside the loop. So I'm saying, give me, one at a time, all the values from to print, and inside the loop, I want access to them using the name value. So it's important to understand here that if I did something like this, oh, that, that actually works. Yeah, let's try that. It still works. This is, this is because it's casting things. Let's try this. I picked a bad example. Here we go. There, okay. Cares are weird. Um, yeah, so if here I have a, now I have an array of ints, and I'm trying to use a character variable to store each int inside the loop. I can't do that. So typically, I would say almost every time you want this variable that's going to store each value from the array to be the same type as the array itself. So I've got an array of ints. I use an int value. I can also do this using my older for loop syntax. So I'm going to create a loop variable called i. I'm going to continue to increment it until as long as it's less than my array's length value. Now, in here, I need to access the values using this index. So this time, I'm going to do this. And, and this, will, this will also work. It does the same thing. So two alternative formats. Now again, as I just pointed out a minute ago, the difference here is that now I actually know not only where what the value is, but I could do, I know what the index is as well. So I can print off the index inside the loop. So again, I have this array storing the values 1, 2, 3, 5, and I can print both the value and the index in this print statement. Stop me if you have questions as we go on. I have a couple of these small examples. All right. What if I wanted to do this? So I want to print every value, but I want to print them on the same line. So let's write the code we wrote before. Again, we're going to use, I'm going to use our enhanced for loop syntax here. I'm going to use println value. So this doesn't do quite what I want. Anybody know how to fix this? So the, the, this, this uh, print statement that we've been using so far, print lin, print line, it prints whatever you give it, and then it creates a new line. So if I don't want it to create a new line, what do I do in the back? Take out the ln. So I'll do system.out.print. 
And then when I'm done, I'm going to put a single empty print line here to make sure I get a new line character at the end. So now what happens is I'm printing them on the same line. And then as soon as I finish the loop, I do an empty print line just to print a new line character. So there's a, there's a line. Okay, questions about this? Small variation on what we just previously did? Okay, so here's a fun one. Let's try to, so here's a, another variant on my for loop. A lot of times, I want to go through the values in an array in order, front to back. Sometimes, I want to go backwards. So I want to start at the end. So it's a little trickier. So let's just uh, set up some scaffolding here. Um, I'm just going to put in my new loop declaration and then the print statement inside there. The question is, what goes in here? What's the first value that I want to use? What's the last valid index of this array? Yeah, in the door. Yeah, so whatever the length of the array is, minus one. So I'm going to create my loop variable, and I'm going to set it to print length minus one. When should I stop? Well, actually, sorry. Let me, let me, let's, you kind of hate how these for loops. Let's, let's go first part, third part, second part. What do I do every time? So now I'm starting with the highest index. What's the next index every time? How do I update my index variable every time through the loop? Somebody new who hasn't spoken up yet today. Yeah. Bingo. So I want to decrement I every time through the loop. So I'm going to start, in this case, the first value is going to be 3. That's length, which is 4 minus 1. Next time I'm going to do 2. Next time I'm going to do 1. When do I stop? What's the last valid index that I want to use? That's one other way to think about it. So I'm starting at the back and I'm going to the front. Yeah, right in the middle there. Zero. So I'll do i is greater than zero. Okay. Does that work? Let's look at the output here. So it looks, uh, I got off to a good start here. I printed d and I printed c and I printed b. Something went wrong here. I'm missing something. What's wrong with this? Yeah. Yeah, so when, when I got to zero, I broke out of the loop. I didn't execute the code anymore because zero is not greater than zero. And so whenever you're going backwards, the, the structure of a for loop statement is a little different. And again, I know that this is confusing. I wish there was a little bit more parity here. But this is the way to go backwards through an array. Not as common as going forwards, but let's do both. So forwards, I start at zero. I continue until it's, while well, it's less than, so this is forwards. Backwards, I start at the last value. I continue until I get to zero, and I decrement. Yeah, forwards, backwards. Ah. All right, let's do another one. Ah, okay, interesting. Now let's, let's, let's raise the complexity bar a little bit here. So now I only want to print the characters if their index is even. So there's a couple ways to do this. Let's try it using a loop that goes through every value to start with. Okay, so here's what we know how to do. We know how to print, we know how to print all the characters in the array. That I know how to do. How do I only print the ones that have even indices? It's going to require something new. I don't want to change the loop. Okay? I want my loop to be the same. But what do I need to do? So the, the, the characters that I shouldn't print are B, because its index is 1. That's odd. 
D because its index is 3, that's odd, and then F because its index is 5. Those are odd. So those are the ones that I want to avoid. But what do I need to do here? I need to combine a couple of things together that we've learned about. So we've learned about loops. The block of code inside a loop can contain any type of statement. I'm looking for someone who hasn't answered a question yet today. Yeah. Yes, I could use an if statement. That sounds like a fantastic idea. So let's put an if statement in here. So I'm only going to print if something is true. So now I need a way to test if a value is even. And this is something that you don't know how to do yet. And I'm going to show you. So the way to do this in Java is to use something called the remainder operator. So this is math. The remainder operator is that percent. What that says is compute the remainder if you divide i by 2. So the nice thing is that if i is even, then the remainder when you divide it by 2 is 0. If i is odd, the remainder when you divide it by 2 is 1 or, be careful, this is not modulus. I'm here to break this to you. This is Java. This is prob Of all the things I hate about Java, this is probably number one. I'm serious. If i is negative and you compute the remainder with 2, what do you get? You get negative 1. I don't know why. It makes me angry. Um, most other languages, this is a modulus. In Java, it's a remainder. So if you use a negative number, you get a negative result. But this works fine. So this says if i is divisible by 2, it's even. Let's see what happens. Boom. Good work. If statement inside our conditional. Let's try to print out the odd indices. So again, um, the right way to do this is to say if the remainder when I divide by 2 is not 0. Not if it's equal to 1. So the Values for the even indices were A, C, and E. The values for the odd indices are B, D, and F. Those are the values of 1, 3, and 5. Good. Questions about this? Yeah. Yes, OK, another way to do this. Let's uh, thank you for reminding me. I was going to go on. Let's look at another way to do this. So somebody suggested that instead of going through one at a time, I could go through two at a time, and that is totally correct. So here what I've done is I've taken the if statement out of my loop, but rather than incrementing every time, I'm incrementing by two. So this will start in index zero, then it'll go through index two, four, until I get to the end of the array. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Does that work? So the question is, can I modify my loop variable inside the loop? The answer is yes. But please don't do this. This is confusing. Yeah. The, uh, the other way is much nicer. Right? If, if you want to do it this way, typically, I would argue that any modifications to the loop variable inside the array are a no-no. There's some times when that's useful, but usually at that point, you can do things differently. Yeah. OK, good. Let's keep going. How about this one? OK, interesting. Similar to something you guys have been working on. I should know how to do this already. So I want to sum every member of the array. How do I approach this? What do I need, first of all? I have an array of values. What am I missing? I need a variable to store my sum. What type should that variable have? What should I call it? Sum. So it's type int because the values in my array are ints. If they were doubles, I would use a double. It's called sum because that's what I'm using it to do. You could call it anything else, but I would argue it probably should be called sum. So now I have the loop that goes through my array. And what do I do inside here? So I'm going through every element in the array. Actually, there's one thing I forgot to do here. What else should I do on line three? should initialize sum, and it should be initialized to what? Zero, yeah. I'm, I'm, my sum starts at zero. 
All right, so what do I do inside the loop? I'm one line of code away from a solution. Well, two, I need to print the sum too, but what do I do? I've got a sum variable to store my sum. I'm going through every element in the array. What do I want to do? I mean, a, a way to think about this when you're approaching these problems and you're getting started is to just think about what you're trying to do. Don't write it in code yet, but I'm going through the array one, one at a time and I'm trying to sum up all the values. I have this value that's storing my sum. So every time I see a new value, what do I do with it? Add it to my sum. So inside here, I'm gonna say sum plus equals. I could also do sum equals eh, sum plus, but let's use this shorthand, sum plus equals to sum i. When I'm done, I'm gonna print off my sum. Let's see if this works. Indeed, it does. So every time I, so I start my sum at zero, I go through every element in the array, and I just add it to the sum, one at a time. When I'm done, I have the answer I want. Questions about this? So, here's where we are. We have checked off all of the basic computer capabilities that I, we wanted to talk about. We've done this quickly, but that's intentional because it gets a lot more interesting at this point. Because what we're gonna start talking about for the next couple weeks are computer algorithms. So what is an algorithm? An algorithm is a way of solving a problem. And we're talking about computer algorithms. So computer algorithms are ways to have a computer solve a problem. You guys all implement algorithms. You don't realize it. You may not have heard this word before, you may not have used it to apply to your own daily life. But you have algorithms that you use in the world for solving problems. Computers have these special capabilities that we've been talking about. And so sometimes the way that we solve problems using computers is similar to the way that we solve problems as humans. But in many cases, it's different because we're harnessing these different capabilities that a computer has. So remember a couple weeks ago, we talked about how computers have learned how to play games. Computers don't learn how to play games by reading books that have information about different strategies. The way that Google's you know, artificial intelligence engine is learning how to play games is playing billions and billions and billions of games. You don't have time to do that. It does, because it's so much faster at repeating things than you are. So that's a case where the computer algorithm for getting good at games and the human algorithm for getting good at games are totally different. And we're going to see that in a few places coming up. Sometimes the simple algorithms we talk about, it's kind of the same way that you would do it, but there's other times where we're going to use these computer powers to our advantage. Sometimes that's going to lead to simpler ways of solving problems. Okay. So, and, and we implement computer algorithms as computer scientists by using these capabilities that you guys already know about. Perform, performing calculations, storing the results, making simple decisions, and probably most importantly, repeating these operations over and over again incredibly fast. If there's anything that is transformative and different about computers, it's the speed at which they can execute these types of calculations. Okay. Oh, I love this graph. So, so algorithms are not a new idea. The, the, the algorithm actually has its root word in the Arabic. I think it's been, the word, this word has been around for a long time. Um, one of the things that we're doing with computers these days is tracking word usage. So this is a graph um, from, from Google, I think, uh, on, on search results for different things. And you can see, I mean, again, algorithms wasn't invented in the 60s, but this massive spike in the usage and interest in the word algorithm really accompanied the rise of computers. Right, so this is 60s, 70s, when people are starting to work on early computer systems and building early computer programs. So in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about lots of different ways to use computers to solve problems. The way that we approach this will always be the same. We're gonna talk about how to solve the problem first. We're gonna come up with a strategy. Because an algorithm is not an implementation. I want you to understand that, because it's really critical. Algorithms are one of the conceptual hearts of computer science. An algorithm is a series of steps for solving a problem. 
you can take a computer algorithm for performing some calculation and you can implement it in Java or Python or C++ or C Sharp or Haskell or Go or Rust or whatever. The implementation is not the algorithm. The algorithm is the process of going about solving the problem. It's the strategy that we use to get to a solution. So we'll first talk about what our strategy is, and that's something I would encourage you to do when you work on our homework problems and MPs. Don't just start writing code. Have a plan. Have a way that you're trying to solve the problem. Then, translate your plan into code. That second step is something that's going to be hard for you for a while. A lot of times, you'll be frustrated because you'll be thinking, I'm just trying to do this simple thing. Like we were just adding the numbers in an array. That's not that complicated, conceptually, to think about but it can be very frustrating to actually get your ideas into working code. But that's what we're going to be teaching you, and you'll get a lot of practice on that for the next couple weeks. Okay, I thought this would be fun to do this one, because this was a homework problem that you guys did recently. Um, so, I have three values. I want to find the maximum of those three values. How am I going to do this? What is my algorithm? What's an approach? that I can use. Let's think through the steps that you would take. If I gave you like three numbers, now, you know, you'd probably just look at them quickly and be like, this is the biggest. But, and inside your brain, there's some sort of algorithm that's, that's being used. So what's a way to do this? Yeah. So I have, I, so I really have three comparisons to make, right? I compare numbers one and two, and then what do I do based on the result? Yeah, so I can sort of go with pa by pair by pair. So I can take the first two numbers and compare them, and keep the larger one. And then I can compare the larger one with the next number, and then keep the larger of those two. And actually, when we go through, and we do the largest value in an entire array of numbers, that's exactly what we're going to do, right? Sort of what we're doing here is we're kind of crossing off one number at a time. So here's a different algorithm. Now, there's, and frequently, there's lots of different ways to solve these problems. Here's one that I'm going to show you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to eliminate values one at a time. And this is, this, again, this is just a trick because of the structure of this problem, because there's only three values. So the first thing I'm going to do is figure out if first is the largest. If first is the largest, I'm done. If not then first can't be the largest. And so I only have two more values to compare. So here's, and again, I, I, I saw some, you know, some of you came up with some much more general solutions to this problem. Uh, but here's a simpler one. So how do I determine if first is the largest? If first is the largest, it has to be bigger than both of the other ones. So I'm just going to skeleton this out. So my first if statement here is entirely devoted to figuring out if first is the biggest. Because if first is the biggest, it should be bigger than second and bigger than third. If that's not true, do I ever have to think about first again? It's not the largest. So how many values do I have left to compare? Only two. So now I can say if second is greater than third, so now I'm just thinking about second. If I drop all the way to the bottom, so if first is bigger than both of the other two, then the biggest one is first. If second is bigger than third at this point, then the biggest number is second. Otherwise, the largest of the three is third. So again, this is, if, you, if you try to apply this to four numbers, it gets uglier and uglier and uglier. And the suggestion over here is a much better approach. But for just three, this is sort of nice. Right? My first if statement essentially rules out first. My second statement rules out second. And if I fall all the way to the bottom, then third must be the biggest. And you'll see that, oh, there's something wrong with one of these. Oh, right. Thank you. You guys are good. Good. Question. Yeah, okay, so the question is, what, what happens if I have some, uh, what happens if I have some equals here? Still works, right? First, it's not the greatest, but that's okay, right? 
because it's tied with something else. Right? I will still find the right value. You, you guys can work this through later. Okay. I'm out of time for today. We're going to pick up here next time. You guys do have homework out this weekend. So the Saturday and Sunday problems will both be due on Sunday night. Give you a little more flexibility. Um, MP0 will be released on Monday. We have office hours again today and on the weekend. I have office hours today at 1. I will see you guys on Monday. Have a great weekend. Stay warm.